Hello and welcome back to Witch Fix. I'm going to be talking today about a book that I said I was going to review quite a while ago and then didn't get around to for the longest time, mainly because the book is part of a set of three and I had tremendous trouble finding the third part for a reasonable amount of money, which here means not 15 fucking quid. So I wanted to review them and be able to read them sort of end to end so I wouldn't forget what was happening in between. Uh, but yeah, it took me ages and I've now got the third one on order. So it's a miracle. The book series I'm talking about is the Merlin books. And these, if you remember way back to when I reviewed the Merlin TV serial with Sam Neill, uh, I said that that series had now been novelised. So the like I think it was three episodes in that mini series had been turned into three novels by James Mallory, and I'd previously read two of them, and I talked a little bit in that episode about that they had more stuff in than was in the TV series because I guess he just made some extra stuff up to fill in some of the gaps where there maybe wasn't time in the TV series to show what happened in between times and they just wanted to get on with the, the actual story so that is basically what the books are they are in places a straight up word for word retelling of the miniseries of what happens to Merlin and Nimue and Arthur and Mab but there is also quite a lot of extra stuff added in to make up some length in the book and to also give a more rounded background to some of the characters that we know from the tv series but also to invent new characters and bring in different characters and show us different sides of existing ones in response to them which i think is quite cool and if you followed my advice and went away and watched the merlin miniseries and you really liked it these books are definitely something to invest in they're not hugely expensive the first two i got for about two pounds each and i just found someone who was selling the third one for two pounds on ebay I've actually previously read the first two. Um, the first one I got was actually the middle one, uh, The King's Wizard. And that's sort of the bulk of the middle of the TV series in that book. And I found it, I think, by chance in a charity shop. And I was really excited because I was like, oh, my God, this this is a book of that film that I really love. And in those days, I wasn't able to buy things online because I was a lot younger. And it took me ages until I ma managed to find a copy of the first book in the series, which is the one I'll be talking about in this episode, Merlin the Old Magic. Uh, I actually remember not liking Merlin the Old Magic as much as The King's Wizard, which on rereading, I can kind of see that because there are some sections that are a bit long and I felt like they could have been maybe a bit shorter. But just to tell you what the old magic is about, it starts from literally um, a point in time, I think, before the actual TV series started. Um, there is a little bit of a montage at the beginning of the TV version, which goes over how King Constant died and how Vortigern became king. That actually hasn't happened yet at the beginning of the book. And it kind of goes through all the things that you see in that montage uh, but as an actual fleshed out plot. So that is actually like the first half of the book is just all of that stuff happening and the events that lead up to Merlin being born. The rest of the book is about Merlin reaching an age where he uses his wizarding talents, which is featured in the film, and him going to the magical world under the hill to learn magic from Mab and Frick. That's also expanded upon greatly and he meets a wider range of characters from the magical world and it's explained in more detail about what the magical world actually is. Now the book comes to an end around the time when Sam Neill actually appears in the TV series as older Merlin, who is the Merlin who sort of carries us through the second act and the third and he has just been approached by Vortigan's soothsayer who's been sent to seek him out as part of Mab's plan to force Merlin to use his magic. So some of the things that are added in this book uh, obviously we get to see a little bit more of Vortigan and a bit more about how he became king which surprise surprise was to do a lot with Mab manipulating him into becoming king there's also a lot more about Avalon, which features more heavily later on, which is where Nimue grows up. It's also where Merlin's mother is because she is a princess and she has been sent there because um, of Vortigan's rule has placed her family in danger. And we learn about the Holy Grail, which was actually at Avalon. And you, there are scenes which have the Holy Grail in it, just kind of floating above an altar, which is quite cool. You find out about how... Um, 
the lady who's called Alyssa became Merlin's mother and how Mab orchestrated all that. So basically it's, it's a lot of extra stuff that shows what kind of a person Mab is. And she was kind of one of the most unknowable characters of the TV series, the queen of the old ways. And there's perhaps a lot that we don't know about her. But throughout the book, we actually get to see her in uh, sort of flashbacks that Merlin sees in different realms of the magical world. So you get to see what she was like when the old ways were in full power in England. And also because we get to see the story from different people's perspectives. We get some stuff from inside Ambrosia's head about what it was like being a priestess of Mab of the old ways, which is, again, really interesting, especially if you're interested in... Um, sort of pre-christian paganism of celtic england it's really cool and very atmospheric and quite enjoyable to read stuff about that and about um the kind of hardships that the characters faced even before Wartigan became king which is basically the official start of the tv series so two of the new characters we see are blaze who is a hermit who lives in the forest where ambrosia lives at the start of the tv series um, he's not featured as much. Uh, Merlin does talk to him and he disappears strangely at the end of the book. So it kind of makes me think that he might pop up again later on. Also, Hearn the Hunter, who is an ex-member of the Wild Hunt, who, like Ambrosia, kind of eschewed the old religion without taking on the new. And so he's forsaken quite a lot of his magical powers and abilities but he is a character who's involved in the plot of the book the plot is basically the same as the tv series but with extra scenes and extra kind of explanations and bits and pieces to make it a bit more interesting obviously if you already know what's going to happen uh, another character introduced is idas he's the lord of the dead who occupies a separate land which is anoeth and basically he is the horned god, the leader of the wild hunt, uh, lord of the land of the dead. And Merlin and Frick actually go on kind of a field trip to the land of the dead and they get to cross the river of life, which is uh, a river of blood with a bridge made of swords over it, which is pretty cool. And Merlin gets to ride with the wild hunt as well as go into a sort of flashback dimension i guess where he gets to see um some of the sacrifices and things made of the romans when uh, the romans were in britain which is again pretty cool now i said that this wasn't my favorite out of the two that i've read and here is why the book is 333 pages long and the actual plot that takes place in it probably only took up about 15 to 20 minutes in the actual film slash miniseries so as you can imagine, some bits of it do stretch out quite a bit. For example, um, there's a moment when Merlin discovers that he has magic. He's kind of gone for a little gallivant in the woods, as he does every day. He meets Nimueway and her sort of cohorts as they're trying to travel to Lord Ardente's castle. And they talk for a bit and then it instantly goes to from him saying don't stray from the path to him always straying from the path and getting stuck in a mud hole that he has to rescue her from in the book there's quite a long section before this where merlin goes to visit blaze and he brings him some stuff that ambrosia's baked for him and they have a little bit of a chat about what it means to be a good person also there's a raven called bran who merlin is friends with because he can talk to animals which isn't really commented on that much but he can talk to animals uh, and they have a little conversation he walks through the woods and he kind of ruminates on you know his feelings and how he feels like he's missing out on something and whether that thing might be love or whether that thing might not be love and then Hearn the hunter conjures a silver deer for him to chase through the woods and he finds a special fountain and there's other stuff that goes on and then he meets him away and then all the rest of it happens the thing is that it does take quite a long time for all of this stuff to happen and because Merlin has to have a lot of introspective thinky thoughtings about the plot and what is happening a lot of it takes place in his head and a lot of it is him thinking about things especially when he gets to the land of magic a lot of things are rehashed over and over again about how he doesn't really feel like there's any point to him learning magic how he doesn't really think that it's real enough or good enough um, and he thinks those things at least four times and it's just rehashed kind of over and over again so while this book does have a lot of interesting extra added insights to the merlin series it also 
because I think not a lot of the original plot takes place in the first part of the film, doesn't really have a lot of base material that's very exciting for it to work with, which is a bit of a shame. But the middle book in the series, I remember having a lot more going on because obviously that's the point at which Merlin is more active in the world of men and he's meeting you know, kings and fighting dragons and all the rest of it. One thing that I actually do really like about this is that it fills in some of the gaps and explains some of the things that maybe the movie didn't really think about as much or didn't have time to show. Uh, for example, in the film, Merlin later on has a horse called Sir Rupert who he can talk to. And I don't think it's really explained where that horse comes from or how it talks or how it knows him. And my recollection of the film is a little bit fuzzy at this point, but I feel like it's not really explained that much. It's just a horse that he conjured that can talk. Whereas in this book, it's explained that the horse was given to him by Idath for the wild hunt and that whenever he needs Sir Rupert, Sir Rupert will be there for him because they have this bond now. And obviously Merlin's ability to talk to animals is also explained earlier on in the book. It's because of his part fairy nature. And that's quite good. And it kind of fills in some of those blanks, which is excellent. Also in the film, Merlin is in the land of magic and the lady of the lake appears to tell him that his foster mother Ambrosia is ill and he should go and see her. And he instantly leaves the land of magic and goes back to see Ambrosia. But in the film, it just kind of cuts to Mab yelling at Ambrosia for Merlin disappearing. And then Merlin turning up to find Ambrosia dead and him getting pissed off at Mab. And I was always kind of wondered, like, how did he get back? Because in the first instance, he had to, like, ride a special kind of unicorn horse to the edge of the lake and then get in a magic boat and then the magic boat took him into the land under the hill and then Frick piloted it all the way to Mab's palace and I was like okay but how did he get back so quickly and that's actually explained and delved into into the book about how the lady of the lake helps him and how he uses magic as well so that's pretty cool and you definitely get more of a sense of what the old ways that they always talk about are like and what they're meant to people and why people are dissatisfied with them and why they're turning towards Christianity. And it definitely looks into the failings of both religions. So on the one hand, you've got the old ways, which were more about opening up this world of wonder and magic to the people. And they could travel between the world of men and the world of death and the world under the hill. And they have these powers and these abilities and they lived in harmony with the land. But on the other side of that, they also worshipped gods who could at times be quite cruel and demanding and who had lost the ability to feel empathy or love for their people. And then and also all the brutal things like the sacrifices of, of blood and of people that those gods demanded. And then on the flip side of that, you've got Christianity, which to Merlin's mother is a religion of love and healing and she believes that the power of the grail should be open to everyone even if they're not Christian that they should do charity and they should do good things for people and then you've got the flip side of Christianity which is King Constant and brother I think his name's Gilbert but they believe that the old ways should be stamped out and if people won't abandon them then they should be killed because nothing should be able to bring that kind of like dark power into the realm of Christianity and they don't have room in their hearts for anyone who doesn't follow their religion. So I like that balance and the way that the story allows for those sides to be explored more fully in the book than they were in on TV and to kind of give you an idea of like the central conflict really of the whole series is between the old ways and Christianity. It's the reason Merlin exists so it's kind of important to have that in there. And it's kind of in that vein that I wanted to read you this little bit. It's actually from like really near the end of the book, like four pages before the, the very end. But I thought it would be nice to read this bit and just give you an idea of what the writing style is like, but also about the kind of extra thoughts and emotions that go into it that obviously are really hard to show on screen. As soon as he woke in the morning, he knew his fate would find him that day. Samhain had fallen a few weeks previously, and Merlin had expected the trouble to come then. When it had not, he had let his guard down a little, thinking that in the dark half of the year, when even kings stayed close to their own hearth sides, he would have a certain amount of shelter. But this morning, his senses, that had told him even in childhood when strangers trespassed in his beloved forest, told him there was danger afoot. 
Merlin awaited it calmly. He went about his usual morning routine, preparing his simple breakfast of herbal tea and acorn bread, and then went to the clearing in the forest. Around him a circle of young trees stood like the pillars of a cathedral, a cathedral of the old ways, growing from the living earth, not made of dead stone as the Christians built. As soon as the thought came to him, Merlin pushed it away. To think in terms of the old ways versus the new religion was to fall into the same trap that Queen Mab had, a trap made of hatred and disgust. Merlin chose to walk a third path, neither of black magic nor white light, a path as grey as mist, where everything was judged on its own merits. He would not hate the new religion, neither would he follow the old ways. He would simply be as he had always been, Merlin the wizard. So I kind of picked that bit out to read as I was finishing the book up last night, because I think there's been like kind of a resurgence of a lot of the old ideas about Wicca and witchcraft that I saw when I was a teenager. Chiefly the idea that witchcraft is this feminist, progressive, amazing thing that frees people. And Christianity is this old Abrahamic doctrine that ties people down and goes against women and all the rest of it. And a lot of people who were perhaps younger who were getting into witchcraft because of, you know, Instagram and other things that this is where they've discovered witchcraft from. They maybe haven't had the time to look at it in the way of seeing that it's not my religion versus your religion or old ideas versus new ideas or my idea is more original and older than yours because paganism was around before Christianity. It's not a competition. It's not a, a movement where you need to just get angry at Christianity and tear it to pieces. Because in all honesty, as someone who went to a, a lot of church schools in their young life, uh, even after I was um, had converted to Wicca, I still went to church school. I still have a Christian family. And there's a lot of good stuff in Christianity. There's a lot of good lessons that you can learn from it. And a lot of those lessons are similar to things that we believe as witches. I mean, if you look at things like the rule of three, isn't that really similar to the doctrine of just treat others as you would be treated? Turn the other cheek, be kind. It, it rings very similarly to me. And I think this extract really kind of reminded me in a way that this whole book series and the corresponding film remind me that Neither religion, either paganism or Christianity, is good or bad or better than the other. It's all about people and who's following that religion, which may not be a groundbreaking idea for a lot of people. But I do see a lot of kind of anti-Christianity and also anti-Islam. They kind of get lumped in together as being uh, patriarchal religions. But it really is up to the individual. And I think if someone is a Christian and if they're a woman, it's how they interpret the Bible and how they want to live their life by it. it doesn't mean necessarily that they're going to allow themselves to be traded to their husband for a donkey and a goat. It just is a very strange idea to me that to make yourself feel good in your religion and to get into it and to explore it, you have to put down what you were part of before. So definitely give a look to the Merlin books if you see them kicking around. You can buy these, you know, where I buy everything, eBay, or on Amazon. They're really quite inexpensive if you buy the paperbacks. I think you can get them in Kindle book as well, which is always good because then it doesn't take up so much space in your room. But either way, definitely give it a read. It's a nice quick read, very accessible writing style, and it's quite gripping as well, just the way that it's written. In that, while bits of it are just dialogue that has been taken straight from, obviously, the script for the film, quite a lot of it is scene setting and description that obviously was not needed in the film, but in the book, it kind of enriches the story a bit more and gives you a bit more scope for imagination as opposed to the terrible 90s CGI. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please do recommend anything that you'd like me to take a look at via Twitter, which is at Witchfix, or email, which is witchfixpodcast at gmail.com. And you can always donate to my Patreon, which is in the description box for this episode. I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.